<laughs> yeah. So uh, I go way out in the ocean, long ways from shore. Very difficult to access. That's why not too much research is done in the middle of the ocean. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, this life of mine in the middle of the deep ocean. Now, um, let's see. Uh, when you're in the middle of the ocean, in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, if you're in an area between 20 to 40 degrees latitude, you will find calm areas like this. They're doldrums, They're also known as gyres, these circulating currents, and it's so calm, it's so very calm. Even big waves are pressed down by the surface uh, weight of the atmosphere. When you have a high pressure system over the ocean, high pressure means heavy weight, that's the weight of the atmosphere pushing down on the ocean, making it calm. The winds are so light. And I observed these things before becoming a scientist in this field. I was just an observer, and that's why I put this slide in, because every one of you has eyes and ears and a nose and touch, and you can perform the very first thing that all scientists do, which is perform observations of your situation, of the world around you, and of yourself. Science starts with observation. And as Descartes notes here, even before you do an experiment, it's much more important to become a skilled observer, to be able to see what's immediately in front of you. Now, I know what's immediately in front of you is your screen on your phone, okay? But that's not reality. It's reality in your phone, but it's not reality. We need to see beyond our phones, to see what's around us, to see what's happening to us, to step back and make observations. Then we can perform experiments, conduct hypotheses, construct hypotheses, and verify them. So. Look at this in the North Pacific, and you'll see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the North Pacific high pressure area. Now, that's enormous. This, look, it goes completely from Asia to North America. This, this is a huge system. This is the largest climatic system on the planet. There's nothing bigger than this no atmospheric phenomena larger than this on our planet. And it's got this high, which is stationary. That's what STNR means there in this weather facts. It means that it's, it's pretty stationary. It doesn't move around a lot. So that high in the northern hemisphere, and we're all here in the northern hemisphere today, that high will produce wind as the air slowly descends from that mountain. That's a mountain of air. This is the peak. The H in the middle there is the peak of a mountain. Let's see, I think there's a laser on here, but I'm not sure if I can use it. Let's see, I'm not seeing it. Anyway, the H in the middle is the center, and that's equivalent to the peak of the mountain. It, it, just like we have mountains of rock, there are mountains of atmosphere, and that mountain of atmosphere, that H is the peak of that mountain of atmosphere, and that's the heaviest part of that atmosphere. So it's pushing down on the surface of the ocean, and that's what's creating uh, this high pressure system that then uh, creates this kind of sea. So, here I am in the middle of the ocean, and there are big storms, you see. There, there was wind blowing, each one of those little lines there is, each one of these arrows, the 
wind speed is 10 knots. So that's 30 knots of wind. So the wind is blowing fast. 30 knots of wind blowing for a long time makes big waves. But here in the garbage patch, that those waves that are generated in the Gulf of Alaska, those big waves, those are pushed down so that the whole surface of the ocean becomes flat in this garbage patch. And that's one of the reasons why when I crossed it in 1997, during the largest El Nino on record that had that enormous high pressure system, that whatever floating plastic maybe had been mixed into the water column, pushed down, it, it floated up to the top. So as I crossed it, I didn't see a m mountain of trash or an island of trash, but what I saw was a piece of plastic here, a piece of plastic there, and it was persistent. I would sail for 100 miles and still come on deck and see another piece of plastic. Then the next day, sail for 100 miles and see a piece of plastic. Uh, can you imagine Magallanes or Vasco da Gama coming on a part of the ocean like that in a boat that sailed, that needed the wind in order to go anywhere? They would be stuck there. This is the rhyme of the ancient mariner when they were stuck. And it said the very sea did rot because it was so calm they couldn't get away. And that phenomenon is prevalent in all five of the subtropical gyres, the South Pacific gyre, the North Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the North Atlantic, and even in the Indian Ocean. So, just as our previous speaker mentioned, when that natural, beautiful, calm, pristine ocean with nothing in it begins to have something in it, it raises questions. It makes us think. It's an observation. When I observe something floating by, I made the observation that that's strange. It's out of place. It's, it's not where it belongs. And why, you know, when you think about how far out in the ocean this is, this is as far from land. Oops. Going up. I know there's a little tiny button there. Okay. Look at land there, land there, there land up there, little Hawaiian island down here. But this is really as remote from any human civilization, from any land-based civilization as anywhere on the planet. It's extremely remote. And why would I be seeing the evidence of human civilization in an area as remote as you can get, as far away from human activity as you can get? This is what, it wasn't because I was a scientist and because I'd been reading literature about plastic pollution that got me involved in studying this phenomenon. This was an observation that I made, a simple observation, that there was something out of place, and it bothered me. Why? Because I consider myself a marine mammal. I grew up swimming, diving, surfing, water skiing, sailing, paddle boarding, aquaplaning, you name it. I was in the water as much as a sea lion they have to get out of the water to warm up to digest their food, you know. They spend a lot of time out of the water. So in and out, in and out, in and out. And when my playground is converted from this incredible, marvelous, pristine environment into something unnatural, it bothered me. So I began to, to think, what's going on here? Well, I did, had begun in my work with this vessel to begin sampling along our California coast. And I knew the scientists that were doing the measurements of the pollution along the California coast. And I said, I think I found a new kind of pollutant in a new area, and I want you to help me make a plan, make a design to go out there and determine just what's going on, because we can't really 
get interest in a problem until we can describe it completely. We make those observations, but you'll be told that those observations are anecdotal, that it's just your personal observation. How do you make your personal observation become something that can be universally accepted? You do that through the process of quantifying scientifically the problem. And in order to do that, you need a design, you need a plan, you need a hypothesis. And so I talked to my colleagues at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project and came up with a hypothesis that if we trawl our sampling equipment in this area, we'll go halfway east-west, halfway north-south, and what we'll do is we'll make random the lengths that we trawl. So each one of these, you see, is a different length. It's random. You see the distance between the trawls is random. Some there's a, a long ways between trawls. Some it's rather short distance between trawls. And we'll trawl continuously through day and through night so that we get this randomized sampling of the area. And uh, this is the program I carried out on my ship in 1999. And this is the area of those first 11 trawls. Well, the results of that were shocking. What we found was that there was six times as much plastic by weight as the zooplankton that came into our net, so that there was more plastic than life in the ocean. That was really the aha moment when we realized that fact. It wasn't people, I had three interviews already here on campus so far with two TV, one uh, recorded interview, and each one of those interviews wanted to know, what did it feel like when you first saw the island of trash? I said, no, this is not real, this is not what happened, this is, a media concoction. What really happened was I just had a feeling something was out of place. I developed a, 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 a hypothesis about it. I went back to test the hypothesis, and then I found out something truly shocking, that there were more plastic in the ocean than life in an enormous area. That is when I became shocked. That is what that changed my feelings about my research priorities. It changed the direction of my life. It wasn't this, um, you know, being slapped in the face by plastic. It was finding out the truth about plastic through research. So remember that when people expect you to already know what you want to do. What you want to do is what you find out you want to do through thinking about it observing and researching. So we had started to get an idea of where the biggest concentrations were after a few years of going out there. These are all the different trips. We started making regular trips after we made this discovery. We didn't stop there. We started looking farther afield, started looking in other places. We went to the Hawaiian Islands and looked there. Uh, and we went back to the same place too and sampled there again. And we started getting, this was before we had models, before we had people, uh, physicists and oceanographers wanting to model where the plastic was in the ocean. This was way before that. Now they're, they're doing that, and they're coming up with these maps. And this is where we've done our research, out here two-thirds of the way to Japan, uh, down in the, what we call the garbage patches there. Then this is the South Pacific, we did that last year. And uh, these are uh, graphic illustrations which don't pretend to be scientifically accurate, but which give you a general idea of how these currents form and, and where they're located. Now, this was our trip to South America. Uh, each we had a blog, and so each day at noon we gave our position. So these are the noon positions over a six-month period of travel 
on my ship from uh, Long Beach, Los Angeles, California, down to uh, Galapagos, then to Isla Pascua, Easter Island, and Juan Fernandez, which we call in the United States Robinson Crusoe Island because of the famous novel by, uh, uh, isn't it Robinson Crusoe, was that Robert Louis Stevenson? Anyway, uh, it's a famous novel about a survivor of a shipwreck on an island. That Robinson Crusoe Island is right here. So the South Pacific garbage patch, oh, by the way, when you go across the equator here, uh, there's a ritual. Uh, if you've never crossed the equator on a ship, you're called a, a polywog, which is a small uh, frog larvae in the water. And a polywog turns into a shellback, which is like an old turtle, like the turtles you saw, by crossing the equator. But they have to be tortured first. So I set up this ghost net and put our polywogs inside the ghost net. This is a Coast Guard commander, and this is a whale expert from Chile. And we threaten them with, we paint them with grease and throw squid guts on them and anchovy guts and uh, threaten them with harpoons and, and uh, gaffs. And then after they go through that ritual, this is zero, zero, zero latitude. That's what's happening at zero, zero latitude. And after that, they become shellback. So we cross the equator. We go down, and we start sampling. Each one of those dots is a place where we've done this manta trawling. You can see the overall uh, picture here. But our focus was really on, on the South Pacific garbage patch, which is kind of like in this area here. And so we did a lot of sampling in the South Pacific. And we trawl a net called this manta trawl, and we pull up the samples, and they look like this. This is uh, about uh, half an hour to an hour trawl uh, in the middle of one of those garbage patches. I'm going to show you two of these. There's another one. Now, if you look at these, they're very similar. If you go to the center of these garbage patches, you're going to find very similar stuff. But I would ask you, you know, which one is from the South Pacific and which one is the North? Is, do you see any clues? You're observing for the first time these samples. Do you see any clues? Anybody have an idea which might be from the South Pacific and which might be from the North Pacific? And what, what do you see there that might cause you to, to choose one hemisphere or the other? Anybody have an idea? Anybody want to give a guess? because I'll, I'll be happy to explain it to you if no one has the courage to guess on what, which is which. No guessers? No, I don't see anybody. The one on the, on the bottom is from the north. Okay. He thinks the one on the bottom is from the north. Why do you think that? Because it, it looks like it has um, that little species that lives in the... Blue copepods? Okay. <laughs> you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what I see here. This is uh, an artifact from oyster aquaculture. It's a tube separating the oysters on a string, all right? And we see a lot of those from Asia. Also, what I see in the uh, top one is, oops, come back here. Um, I see smaller average size class. So this is, hadn't had as long to break down. The southern hemisphere has not had this throwaway society concept where we're going to just have our trash go out into the ocean. As the previous speaker showed you, you had pristine beaches not so long ago. Now you've started throwing your plastic in the ocean, but it hasn't had as much time to break down. So I think as time goes on, the size class will become smaller, and your average size class, I think, here is a little smaller than the average size class there. Um, I also think that, uh, and this is a theory, you can, if you have some oceanographers on campus that want to test this theory, I'd be anxious to hear. I believe that there's fewer nutrients in the South Pacific garbage patch than in the North Pacific garbage patch. I believe the circumpolar current, which really goes so fast that it tips sideways 
and scours the bottom and pulls all those nutrients up actually decays in the northern hemisphere that it goes underneath the South Pacific garbage patch and really the North Pacific is where all the currents in the ocean come to rest. It's where the currents decay. It's the largest body and it's just where things end up. So uh, I think perhaps there's more biofouling, more nutrients uh, available in the uh, North Pacific uh, trawl sample. So that's, that's the North Pacific uh, trawl sample, the one uh, that was taken there. All right. Uh, once we get those samples, we sort them by the size. These are the different size plastics. And you think, well, now, if I've got, this is from one trawl, if I've got all these particles here, and they're one to three millimeters, and they're breaking down, you know, shouldn't I have at least, you know, the accumulated these together, shouldn't they be some, you know, somewhere near the, the volume of those? And we don't see that. As they get smaller, they start to disappear. It's like you take the cookie and crumble it up, and it makes a lot of crumbs, but the crumbs are disappearing. And this is one of the, the issues that scientists are looking at now, is why do we not find the small plastics out there. Uh, we think there's a lot of mechanisms involved, but probably consumption is a big one. Uh, they're being eaten. Uh, then we have uh, the types. And we, we were shown earlier the pre-production plastic pellets. All of the plastic items, the chairs you're sitting on, they all start out as these pellets, all right? They make the foam, they make the line, they make the, the thin plastic films, the packaging, and they make the miscellaneous fragments when they're melted down. That's how it's shipped to factories. They can use the same technology they use in, in shipping sugar or rice or wheat or corn. Those vacuum tubes are used in the same way to ship plastic pellets. And we also, Look at the big stuff, too, when we're out there. We've done tracking surveys for NOAA. This is uh, ghost net wrangling. These are cowboys of the deep ocean wrangling a ghost net, and they're putting on a tie, a tie to this buoy, so that this has solar panels on it. This is uh, collecting solar energy to power it. <laughs> and. Um, they're tracking them. So what do the tracks look like? There's another one. There you can see the solar panel a lot better on this one there. Uh, they're going around in a circle. That's what this gyre does. It goes around in a circle. So that's the track of four of those buoys that we deployed uh, in 2005 on ghost nets. Uh, there you can see a little later how this stuff is still pretty much staying, it's not going anywhere very fast, all right? That's what characterizes these garbage patches is things rest there a long time. Now, uh, birds are being affected, and especially the albatross. The albatross is our companion out there. The, uh, the, the one bird that we're gonna see the most of as we sail in the deep, deep ocean is going to be the albatross. Uh, and they're big, I mean, look, look at the, the stomach, this is a biologist, her stomach is right here. This is the stomach of a four-month-old Laysan albatross chick. I mean, the stomach of that bird is about as big as her stomach, if not bigger. And that's what should be inside, just before they take off. These are young birds, and, and just before this young bird flies away, it regurgitates. It doesn't have this regurgitation reflex until it's about six months old. But then it can vomit and throw up all the leftovers from what the parent has fed it during its the longest of any bird's fledgling status, six months. And uh, that's what should be there. But that is an old photograph. That's one I took with Carla McDermott over at the University of Hawaii where she'd been collecting back in the 80s. Now this is what is inside that bird. This is the contents. The squid beaks 
are still there. They're down here. That stuff that was in the previous photograph is still here. But these are the things now that a lot, and this bird, of course, didn't, it couldn't get it all up. It died. It died with a full stomach. So we're seeing this in a lot of albatross. And the bottle caps are a big problem. You can see bottle cap, bottle cap, bottle cap, bottle cap, bottle cap, bottle cap. So we're making a, a legislative proposal to have these plastic bottles that are everywhere on campus here, which you've got to get rid of. You need to have a leash on the lid so that it can't come off the bottle. When you unscrew it, keep the cap on the bottle. Otherwise, it's going to get out in the ocean, an albatross is going to eat it, it's going to feed it to her baby chick, who's not going to be able to regurgitate that, and it's going to kill it. And it's killing thousands of these birds every year. So, leash the lid. This, as you can see, uh, we work with uh, scientists at uh, UC Santa Cruz who follows the birds by tracking them. And you can see they're feeding out here in this garbage patch north of Hawaii. And there's another colony down off Baja California in Guadalupe Island uh, feeding along the California coast. But they pick up a lot of that trash out of the ocean. Uh, you can see um, they, they like things that look like food. Things that are brown and tan are the uh, color that they prefer. But you see all the colors of them inside those birds. But uh, when we did our first survey, we studied 27,000 little pieces of microplastic, and only 83 were tan in color. So we think there's a lot of selection going on by color in terms of removal of what uh, microplastics are floating out in the ocean. But this is not, would not be color that a salp would ingest. A salp is the vacuum cleaner of the ocean. These are chordate jellyfish. Chordate meaning they have the rudimentary constituents of a backbone, which means they're distantly related to humans. These are chordate jellies. They process half the water column. They inhabit every day. They're, they're more efficient at processing ocean water than any other creature. And anything that goes inside of them that's solid is going to stick there. And so they're becoming full of plastic, just like those albatross. But these are miniature zooplankton in the ocean that are the food for fish. They're eaten by 50 over 50 species of fish. You can see that the plastic bags are food. Can, those are bite marks. Now, everyone wants to know where is it coming from? The question every interviewer asked me while I was doing interviews today was, well, where is it coming from? Well, this diagram assumes it's coming from everywhere. This is uh, equally, this is democratic. It's letting every coastline of the world pollute the ocean equally. And we're, it's watching where it goes. It's watching the formation of those gyres. And as you can see, we're starting to locate the first one, this eastern North Pacific garbage patch. We're seeing how the North Atlantic here off Portugal, it's really coast to coast. It goes boom. It's much wider. It's not as concentrated. You'll start to see, as you see the red color forming here, uh, you don't see a really red central spot there. Uh, because uh, the Atlantic is a more nervous ocean. I've heard oceanographers describe the Atlantic as a more nervous ocean, more turbulent, more mixing. And you don't get the, the kind of concentration that you do in other places like in the Pacific. The North and South Pacific has uh, more dense concentrations of plastic. Uh, you can see that the Indian Ocean is probably the least dense here, as, uh, but there, you know, there's places in the gulfs where there's a lot of plastic. And that plane that crashed, I told them, they came to me and wanted to know, well, after the Malaysian plane crashed, they couldn't find the remains of the plane. I said, you're, you're not going to find them because there's going to be so much plastic. You're not going to be able to tell what's plastic from other sources and what's plastic from the plane. And that turned out to be true. 
They never found a floating piece of debris from that plane. Only when it washed up on shore did they find pieces of that plane. So our ocean is now so littered with plastic that when we have a plane crash, unless you immediately know exactly where that plane went down, you're not going to be able to find remnants of that plane by looking out in the ocean in, in any place at all like these garbage patches. And now you can see it's coming to the end, and you can see, uh, you know, did you know that we have uh, plastic orbiting the Earth, uh, uh, a billion pieces of plastic orbiting the Earth, and trash from the space program? Yeah. That's how much enters the ocean every day. So we have more than floating in space. So I'm going to take you with me. I, I, I did this discussion in Chile. Uh, hablo español. Y mi discurso fue en español en Chile. Y voy a darles este viaje al centro del giro del Pacífico Norte en español, porque para ellos lo es, hice en español. So vamos a verlo ahora. Ahí va. OK. So lleva dos semanas para llegar. La red manta. One single hour long sample. Una hora de esa red. Wow. That's a lot for a single hour-long sample. What can you say about it? Uh, this is uh, just incredibly alarming to me because uh, this far from the center of the garbage hatch, I've, I've, ne I've never even seen a sample with that large a plastic to plankton ratio in the middle of the garbage patch. You know, we're not even there yet, and it's in the hundreds to one greater than plastic, you know, plastic greater than the amount of plankton. It's huge, it may be in the thousand storm. That's just part of the sample. There's the whole sample. Here, let's put it in the sun for you guys. Look at all the eggs. Quite a meal for a bird there. You can see the eggs covering this would be attractive to a bird feeding, but inside would be the plastic. This is a sea anemone with plastic inside. You can see uh, there. Plastic pieces, the salp. Oh, plastic. Oh, yeah. Nice handle for something. Oh. Bottom noodle. Bottom noodle. Yeah. Big sample. It is just putting it. 
Really? It's 30 minutes. That's how full 30 minutes? You can't even do an hour. You can't even do an hour out here. Oh man. It's filling up. It's filling up. So we have two lines out. We're again trying for Jesus to capture a fish as a control so we can test its toxicity levels. To look at the blood and the liver and then compare within the gyre so we're hoping to get our control the sea surface temperature is uh still a little bit cool but um once we get to about 16 or 17 degrees celsius it should be improved This, this study is yeah, really plastic fishing line. All right, you got a piece out of the first fish. First fish had plastic. Big predator. Albacore tuna. We now have evidence that Albacore tuna eats plastic. So Probably this was to be the control fish for a study of stress here? levels in fish that eat plastic. Fish here we are fishing for these mitopins. Uh, the largest. How you doing uh, that? I'm Matt. This is a good size one here. I could use this guy. They're the most common vertebrate on the planet. They're 50% of fish biomass is this one genus They're not that size. The metophidae. Very common fish, but only in the deep ocean. That's why you haven't heard about it, why you're not having it for lunch today, is because it doesn't school, doesn't make cardumen in. Wow. So it's Way away from the center of the jar. Woo, bad. Well, these guys that are trying to make everything sound like it's getting better, you know. So Jesus Reyes is taking samples of the metoped blood to analyze in the laboratory to determine their proteomics, their stress levels using proteomics. Uh, finding their uh, thyroid hormone level. Basically, seeing what eating plastic does to you, because we found 35% of these fish had eaten plastic. And there you can see what uh, it looks like inside the fish that's eaten plastic. Half. Now, there is one island of plastic I found that I could actually walk on. That was in 2014. We were using drones at that time. 12 meters, 14, 15, 20. You can see the, uh, I'm looking, yeah, now I see the boat. Okay, can you can see better? I see better, I have better quality. Uh, I'd have less striation. There it is, Isaac's Island. 70 buoys, 70 buoys. standing on Hyzex buoy island. These Hyzex buoys, these large black buoys, were released by the Japanese tsunami on March 11, 2011, and came as part of an array that was used in oyster aquaculture. Each buoy has a rope on it with scallop shells woven into the rope for oyster spat to recruit to and grow on. Um, this oyster farming operation was wrecked, including the anchoring structure, and drifted out here into the Central Pacific, forming an island. I even made a map like Captain Cook. I said, I've discovered a new land. I must make a map. We're calling uh, Sunken Buoy Reef out to the west. I can see an albatross flying out there. Uh, it extends about 30 feet uh, as a reef, kind of, with a tail on the west side of the island. We're drifting gradually to the eastward at the moment. We have uh, 
another rope beach here at the end of the island, and it gathers all the kinds of things that we find in our trawls and in our surveys, such as these uh, traps for eels. These are one of the most common debris items that we find out here. A lot of bait traps in the fishing industry, but we also find consumer goods as well. And there's cups like this, there's lids of trash cans like this. Here is the south point of the island. This makes a kind of a little jetty going out here. And uh, it uh, is matted rope that is catching a lot of plastic fragments. If you can see right down here, there's a tremendous number of these small plastic fragments that litter the beaches in Hawaii. These fragments have been caught by this island and serves as a beach out here in the middle of the garbage patch collecting the garbage. So this is an artificial island in the middle of the ocean. Now we're going to go underneath and see. Uh, driftwood as well, happening. as you can see here. Uh, driftwood has made it to the island. And uh, it continues to collect more and more stuff. We do not have the technology or the wherewithal to tow it away or dismantle it and take it away. We're a small research vessel. So this will have to remain here when we leave. So one reason why this didn't blow away is because it had sea anchors. It had 12 meter deep anchors. When it was broken away from land, it carried some of the anchors with it. And there's ghost fishing. This is what I mean by millions of fish being killed every year with no fishermen killing them, wasted fish. heavier, the water stopped floating and sank down, so it became part of the anchoring system. And when it was on the surface, it collected barnacles, but the barnacles need to be near the surface in order to survive. So now we're going to start talking a little bit about the microplastics, uh, the, I mean the true nano plastics. These are things that are going to get down into the plankton and be part of the plankton. Um, there's a uh, photograph taken under a microscope showing uh, a scale and, and you'll be able to see like, you know, hitchhikers, even on tiny bits of plastic, there are eggs of small invertebrates laid on those, creating this new habitat. And look at the edge of this. Now, this is just a millimeter long piece. It's a couple of, you know, just a little over a millimeter long. But look at, you know, it, so I showed you the, the Ziploc baggie where you saw being chewed around the edge of the baggie and, and you can see the holes in it. Well, that's in a macro scale. But there's the same kind of chewing and rasping going on at the micro scale. There are organisms in the ocean that have the ability to create these jagged edges around this microplastic. So I think that's very significant to think about where this plastic is going. If it's going into the food chain, it's not delivering nutrients. As a matter of fact, it's delivering pollutants, persistent organic pollutants. Uh, this is another aspect. After things die in the ocean, they become what's called marine snow. They start gradually sinking down, and that is the mechanism for carbon sequestration in the ocean. The things that die in the ocean go down to the bottom of the ocean, and that's carbon, and that stays out of the system. 
Well, here you, if you're going to pl start putting a bunch of plastic into the marine snow, it's going to take it longer to sink to the bottom. It's like putting little life jackets on it. Same thing's happening with the McTophid. They're getting put into that situation. But you can just see how small these fibers are. Uh, they're starting to be just like the little feelers on the zooplankton. <clears throat> and you can see this phenomenon of the edges being rasped like that. I see it on a lot of different particles. Uh, something you can start to look for if you're into microplastic research is uh, particles like this. Now, you, when you find them on the shore, they've already been kind of rolled around in the beach in the sand, and maybe you won't see that phenomenon. So you need to capture them out in the ocean to see this kind of a phenomenon. Uh, but I think it's significant. I, I just can't imagine that that's some form of uh, embrittlement, where it's just getting brittle on the edge and cracking off. I think it's some active organism is actually attacking this thing. Uh, and the longer these things stay out at sea, the more pollutants they obtain, and actually it does turn them yellow. Uh, Dr. Takata in Japan, uh, when you're collecting pellets for him, he'll analyze them for you if you just send them to him in an envelope, but he'd like you to collect the ones uh, that are yellower because they have more of the persistent organic pollutants that he's looking for. So uh, they can, these one on the end there could have like a million times the amount of plastic that's in the surrounding seawater. They absorb, they're a sponge for these persistent organic pollutants and they look just like fish eggs. So a bird or a fish that's used to eating the eggs of other fish could be mistaking that for food, consuming it, and consuming pollutants at a very high level that then desorb into the fish. So this is damaging the fitness of the marine food web. That's what we're doing with our polluted plastic. And, and there you can see this fish that we like, the, the lantern fish that we're studying. Uh, the lanterns are these little bioluminescent spots. These are uh, bioluminescent spots there. And um, the, the thing about these fish is their lifestyle. This makes them accident prone. Their lifestyle is that they live deep. So here you can see on this graph uh, where they are during the day. Where they are during the day is down deep, down here. That's where the biomass is during the day. At night, they come up to the surface. So when they're on the surface, they're only there in the dark. So they're feeding very quickly because they have, the reason why they're the most common vertebrate on the planet is they're so successful at living and procreating and being the most common, in, common vertebrate on the planet is that they hide. They live their lives in darkness. They're not visible to predators. So that ability to hide is very important to them. Well, what are we doing? We're making them starved because we're feeding them plastic with no food value. Then we're putting these little flotation devices, like little life jackets in them, and asking them to swim down a mile in the ocean with fewer nutrients than they would normally have. So they have to exert more energy with less nutrients. This, to me, is a road to extinction, and if we damage the fitness of the basic food web in the ocean, the thing that all the other fish are eating, the swordfish, the marlin, the tuna, the mahi-mahi, seals, dolphins, whales, are all consuming these mctophids, then we're damaging a very significant part of the marine food web, and other species could suffer because of that. And I'll just leave you with this image. Uh, when thinking about the McTophids, this is now our world. We're next. We are not immune from this phenomenon of having accidentally consumed plastic. We're at, this is accidental consumption, and we are in now at the point in which we are beginning to accidentally consume plastic with our seafood, and now it's been shown to be in salt, to be in our honey, and our beer. Even that Guinness, it's still got plastic in it. 
So uh, now I'm d the, the rest of the talk's a little bit of for the scientists here about how we're learning to understand this phenomenon of these gyres better and how we're uh, working with modelers now to, to do this. Uh, I think I've got enough time to, to go through this. Um, <coughs> NOAA re and, and released, had the Global Drifters Project where they released these buoys with anchors on them to simulate where things would go in the ocean to determine where surface currents would take things in the ocean. That's the SCUD model. And uh, by working with the Dr. Maximenko at the University of Hawaii, uh, we elaborate, this was our first try at it before we worked with any modelers, we could kind of see that there was this garbage patch, okay? We could kind of see it in our data, but we didn't have his technique. Using his technique, he modeled each one of our cruises out to this 11 station uh, area where we did this study. The, the 11 stations are in this little kind of V shape, inverted V right here. And you could see this was in uh, 1999 when we first started and we were outside the garbage patch in the yellow there. Uh, in uh, 2014, we were uh, very, very close to it. In fact, we were kind of in the red part. So uh, our idea was, well, we're gonna monitor whether or not this plastic is increasing. We're gonna to go to the same 11 stations. We're gonna go and monitor those same trawls year after year, and we're gonna see how it changes. But we didn't realize that this garbage patch was moving around that much. So here's the results of just our raw data, all right? Looking at 2014, there was a huge increase. This is after the Japanese tsunami, plus uh, a lot of more plastic production, as was shown uh, in the previous presentation, how plastic production has surged. So it's going up, but we have to take that with relationship to where we are. Relating, this is another uh, modeler's depiction of the garbage patch. And, uh, if you look at distance from this model center, you can see that truly the um, largest concentration of plastic is when you're really close to the center in the model. That's pretty consistent. That shows up pretty consistently. So uh, we also wanted to know whether or not wind was affecting this. So we had a very lucky opportunity when we first arrived you know with climate change now that beautiful calm gyre I showed you is now being disrupted more by wind uh, the winds are more chaotic they're not as predictable as they used to be and they swept through this garbage patch area when we first arrived in 2014 and it was too rough to begin sampling so we had to wait until it calmed down and then uh, start sampling and so we, were, we had a rough period, and then we had a calm period, and we were able to compare them for the effects of wind, and yet there wasn't much difference. You can see the wind speed here. Uh, as the wind speed went up, uh, the, the, this was actually a gutter off of a Japanese house that had floated out there and got caught in our net, four foot long piece. But that was at fairly high wind speed, see? So this is just at our 11 stations, uh, looking at, you know, in calm conditions versus windy conditions. And we didn't see a lot of difference in terms of the mass of plastic that we're picking up. Even when we looked at all of our stations, it's a very noisy graph. Just because the wind is blowing up to 20 knots doesn't mean that you're gonna get a lot less mass of plastic in your trawl, all right? So the effects of wind were not that great. So let's put that together and 
everybody wants to know, is it getting worse? Is, and that's why we do monitoring to know if it's getting worse. We want to go to the same place, do the same thing, find if it's getting worse. But when you're out in the middle of the ocean, you're not going to the same place. The ocean is moving all the time. It's always different. It's never going to be the same place when you go in the ocean. So uh, we applied the methodology to all 361 sites sampled between 1990 and 2014. It revealed a positive trend in this surface. Neuston means the surface plastics. But it wasn't as great as what you saw in that graph. Uh, it was only five times as much increase compared to you know, 50 or 100 times in that other one. So if you look at these two ways of thinking about it, uh, one with just going to the same place, doing the same trawl over again, we saw this huge increase. But if we realize that in, in 1999, when we first went there, we weren't in the center of the garbage patch. And in 2014, we were there pretty darn close to the center. So between those two sampling excursions, there was a movement of this phenomenon. And it really may have only been a five times increase overall in terms of this whole garbage patch. So we need to work with the modelers to figure that out. Uh, and if you look at the variability from one sample to another, the ocean is so variable. Even when you're in the garbage patch, you can have one trawl that's full of plastic, and the next trawl be fairly light. So it's not a consistent phenomenon. Even when you're in the center of the garbage patch, you get this, this graph compares the variability between samples adjacent to one another. So we sample, stop, then do the next sample, and then compare those two, there's a great difference between those two samples. So that's something that needs to be taken into account, too, when we think about what's going on with the trend in the ocean. So uh, it turns out that just going back to the same location and doing the same thing, which is normally what you would do here in the coastal zone, because you know exactly where you are, the currents are the same. You get the same geographic and oceanographic phenomenon. And it makes sense to monitor the coastal ocean by going to the exact same geographic coordinates. But with relation to the deep ocean, it only makes sense to go with relation to where that phenomenon has moved to. And that's what we have to do in future. So in future, we're not going to worry so much about going back to that same original 11 station that caused me so much concern when I monitored in 1999. Turns out I would have been even more worried if I'd have been in the center of the garbage patch that year. I wasn't there. Uh, and then when you saw me uh, in that video saying we're not even there yet and how bad it was, we were already there. I didn't know it. I didn't have the advantage of this model at that time. So I was wrong when I thought that I wasn't there yet. I was already there. So these are the uh, uh, conclusions. Just we need to work with models incorporating all the factors to assess the trends in concentration, constant composition, and characteristics of the plastic debris. So this is the way it looked this year when we went out there. Uh, it's not a very simple shape. You know, uh, There's a lot of variation out there. Uh, but we did go with the express purpose of ground truthing this model, and it was very good. We were like in this area here where, um, oh geez, it happens every time. Um, we were sailing out of LA right here, and this area here, this blue was supposed to be very light, it was light. When we got to the yellow area right here, it did start to increase. So we found his model to be very good. And we're going to work with him in the future. We're going to publish a paper now uh, with these uh, conclusions in it. And uh, that's just uh, the next thing on my to-do list is, is to do that. But OK, so I want to leave you today with the, <coughs> the conclusion that the life that we um, are living is being invaded by plastic. There's a plastic attack going on. We're being attacked by plastic. And it's invading our tissue. This is a jellyfish called a Valella Valella that doesn't feed on the plastic. 
It's on the surface of the ocean. It's floating. It's called the by the wind sailor. It's a jellyfish that sails along the surface of the ocean. And it just bumped into the plastic. And it has a gelatinous surface on its body. And the plastic stuck to it. And just like an oyster makes a pearl out of a grain of sand, this jellyfish covered the plastic with its body. So we're creating these plastic jellyfish. This is the process of incorporating this man-made material into the fabric of life itself. Folks, that can't be good. There's no way to spin it. I don't care if you're Donald Trump's press secretary. You can't spin it so that plastic jellyfish is a good thing. It's never going to be good to have plastic people and it's passing the blood-brain barrier in fish. We know it's affecting our own brains when we breathe plastic. It's in the dust now. So when my colleague was up here saying that he had a personal mission to make change in this situation, that's my personal mission as well. We must change this situation. And I've been traveling the globe to bring this information to people in order precisely to create the political will to make radical change, which will be necessary both for climate and for plastic pollution, which is now getting up to the level of climate change as a problem for humanity to address. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.